Okay, so um, today we'll be learning to unpack a key. We're going to get started with some data first. Um, grade level star tests. So in sixth grade, they only take two tests. They take reading and math. In seventh grade, they begin embedding um, writing. And in addition, they have reading and math. And in eighth grade, they have reading, math, social studies, and science. Um, as to why they take away writing in seventh grade and don't embed it until ninth grade, is a mystery, but the embedding of social studies and science is meant to help them um, once they actually go off to high school because um, they'll be taking more advanced classes like biology, uh, world history, and things of that nature. Starting with Alpha Middle School's 2018-19 star performance, um, down here I'm going to go through each uh, section Slowly, um, star performance, we have the number of assessments, how many students met approaches grade level or above. So these numbers have the masters and the uh, and the meet students already in them. And then we have our meets grade level or above and our masters grade level or above. So in reading, which is tested 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, there were 600 assessments that were passed out. From those 600 assessments, um, only 409 of those actually met approaches level. Now, approaches does not mean that they actually pass. Approaches simply means that um, they're less than a handful of questions away to actually meet the state standard. Um, moving on down to our meets grade level or above. Out of those 409, 227 actually passed the test. So essentially, out of those 600, only 227 uh, actually met state requirement, meaning that that is 37% of the full 600. Now, Keep in mind that it is 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, so that 37% has to be split into three different parts, meaning that there was only 12%, um, there was a 12% passing rate per grade level. Now, if we go on into our masters, we only have 87 students out of the 600, which was from 6th, 7th, and 8th grade um, that passed, making it 14% overall throughout the entire three grade levels. And only 4.6 of those um, per grade level passed. So essentially, it was only about four or five students. If we go down to our math, um, which is also tested, tested sixth, seventh, and eighth, we had 600 uh, assessments passed out. 476 of those assessments were actually um, approaches grade level or above. Staff members, teachers, and staff, if you would like to report to the parental room, we are celebrating Counselors Week today. So please come by. We're so um, out of those 600, only 476 of them actually met the approaches grade level again, which means that they are a handful of questions from passing. Um, moving down to people who actually met standards was 306. So because it is for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, only 51% of those passed. 51% uh, of the 600 passed. Um, splitting it into three sections, assuming that um, the same amount of students passed 6th, 7th, and 8th grade math means that 17% of students per grade level passed. Um, for masters, um, it was only it was 132 students who mastered it, making it a 22% passing rate. And if you divided it evenly between three grade levels, it was 7.3%. Um, going on to writing, which only happens in seventh grade, 203 assessments were passed out. 120 met approaches grade level. Only 73 of those 203 students actually passed, meaning that we have a 35% passing rate for last year for writing in seventh grade. Um, masters, only 13% of them actually mastered it, meaning that only 28 students out of the 203 students uh, got comprehended the entire curriculum. Moving on to science, which is only tested in eighth grade, 205 tests were passed because um, that's not how many students there is in eighth grade, but that's how many uh, students were present. This does not count retesters at all. Um, so 160 of those actually were on the approaches level and a handful of passing. So 87 of, of those 160 passed, making it 42% from these 160s. So just to clarify, these averages here that are given are based off of those that actually uh, took the assessment. So uh, then we go on to our master's grade level. They got 38 students, which is 18%. And finally, on to our social studies, which is for eighth grade, 202 students tested. 133 of those students were a handful of questions away from passing or actually passed. And 70 students, which is 34%, actually met standard, state standard. 34, uh, 34 students, which is 16% of the overall 202, uh, 
actually mastered the content, meaning that they fully understood what science is all about. These are simply the totals once you add all of these up. So as a whole Alamo Middle School um, approaches grade level, they have 71%, which is essentially really good, meaning that we just have to work on a couple of questions to um, re reach meets. And then these, uh, for meets, only 42% of all assessments taken were passed, um, including 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And for our master's grade level, only 17% out of those 1,810 assessments that were passed out actually met uh, the state standard. If we move on to our performance for reading and math, the reason that I narrowed it down to just those two is in terms of need. If you notice, these percentages, these two are the only ones that have percentages at the bottom because these two columns are the only ones that are shared between 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, so overall, if we don't divide them and we just do it as a whole, it was 14% and 22%, meaning that there is much more uh, need in reading and much more help that needs to get done in reading opposed to math. Um, and there should be there are several factors for this. Um, we are predominantly a um, campus full of ELs, and because ELs have a language barrier between um, their native language and English, it is difficult for them to understand context and understand um, inferencing. But math, it's it's a universal type of thing. You don't need to know language in order to know numbers, um, which is why I predict that there is a higher class rate of math. So once we narrow it down to those two, again, um, there is more need for reading. So then we will just focus on our reading uh, star performance. So again, 600 assessments were passed out, 409 um, were approaches, or, and out of those 409, 227 met grade level or above. These numbers are still shared, meaning that around 12% of students, assuming that they are individually shared, um, met state standard. And then 87 out of those 600, which is only 14%, um, actually mastered the content, and 4.3% um, for grade level. So it really was about three, four, maybe five students that, that mastered the reading star. Now if we actually break it down between grade levels, we had 198 sixth grade students test that reading star. Um, so what I had shown you before was a overall as a school, all of it combined. This is diving deeper into it and actually giving you the numbers per grade level. So 198 assessments, um, were passed out out of those 198, 144 were approaches, which makes it 72%. Now, out of those 144, only 81, which is 40% of the 198, actually met state standard. Um, the master's level is 0 0.05 overall. Um, only 11 students out of, out of those 198 actually mastered the sixth grade reading star. Um, we do have three reading teachers, so if we divide those 11 between those three reading teachers, only a handful of students per teacher passed. Seventh grade, um, there was 220 assessments done, and there was 160 students out of those 220 that actually uh, got approaches, which was 72, and then going down to how many students actually passed, 76, making it a 34% passing rate, which means that only 10 students out of the 220, which is 0.04%, actually uh, mastered the content. Now in eighth grade, 182 took the test, 105 uh, was approaches, 70 from those meets actually met state standard, which is 38%, and 8 out of those 70 uh, actually mastered it. So overall, this was part of the chart that you had seen in the beginning. Um, based off of our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, thank you. Uh, based on our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, 7th uh, grade seems to have the most need because this is 0 0.05 and this is, these are 0 0.04. So we'd be zooming into the 7th and 8th grade um, passing standards for those two. Now, um, once we head down into these two, you start doing comparisons. Clearly there's less students in eighth grade, which might be uh, kind of a reason as to why there's there's less numbers. Now these 160s for approaches, because there's more students, there's more students that actually approached it. And because there's less students, there's less students that approached it. So 72% of the students actually um, approached it, while 57 did the same. Now in the meets grade level, 76 students out of the 220 and 70 out of the 182. Excuse me, staff, please come by the parental room to celebrate counts this week. Let your counselor know how much you appreciate them. Please come by and have a slice of cake with us. Counts 
Um, so out of those 76 and those 70, it was 34 and 38 percent. Now that master's grade level, 10 students from seventh grade um, actually mastered it, opposed to eight students um, out of those 182 that mastered it. So they were both at 0.04 percent uh, master's level, but clearly there is a big uh, gap between the 220 and the 182, around 40 students, meaning that there is more need in seventh grade. So once we break it down like that, that is the one that we will be focusing on. And then we actually start comparing between state district and campus needs. In sixth grade, um, our state surpassed us in both district and campus. However, at the campus, we scored more um, than the district. In seventh grade, it was kind of like just straight down. Our state scored a lot more, our district was right after, and our campus did not meet either goals. In eighth grade, however, um, we did not meet, we as a campus met or surpass our state goal, but did not surpass our district goal, meaning that we still need help with our, um, as, a, as a district as a whole. So seventh grade would be the area of need. And then need special populations campus comparisons for 2018-19 Reading Star. Um, if we break down our special populations instead of, and weed out our gen ed pop that don't do at risk, our econ economically disadvantaged kids are almost um, reaching our campus passing percentage, and our ELs are far behind our special education. Special education students only vary between um, special education students only vary between um, a handful of students per class. So the economically advantaged students are almost as close as our campus students are. So then the 2018-19 seventh grade reading star EL performance. Um, a total number of students in seventh grade, we have 220. And a Jose Montemayor, you write it up front. Jose Montemayor. A uh, total number of students, we have 220, EL, um, I'm sorry, 20 to 20 Gen Ed Pop students. Um, and the total number of ELs, we have 150. So that is a big amount of students that we carry in seventh grade that are actually um, have a language barrier. Out of those 150, 35 of them did not meet standard at all. Ayala, to the front office, please, Ayala. 76 out of those 150 were approaching, but only 20% out of the 150 actually met the standard, meaning that 30 students passed. Um, from our 150, only nine of our EOs actually mastered curriculum. So if we go into our 2018-19 Reading Stars TEAK weight, um, each TEAK has a specific weight. Uh, you grab this from TEA. 7.2 had about three times that it was questioned, 7.5 had about four, um, 7.6 had two, 7.8 had four, and so on and so forth. However, however, figure 19D was something that was embedded throughout the entire curriculum, um, which means that it is almost half of the test. There's usually about 40, 42 questions in the STAR test, and 18 of those 40 and 42 questions were based off of figure 19D. This was from last year. I went ahead and did the year before as well, 17 and 18, and it was actually more. We had 19 questions that were solely figure 19D, opposed to the other TEKS that were tested. So figure 19D discusses about making complex inferences about text and use of textual evidence to support understanding. Um, the TEKS as a whole is embedded throughout each question and question stem. It is not a TEKS that is solely um, Redefined or condensed into one specific question, meaning that it, it is it is fairly difficult for ELs, which is something that we're focusing on, um, to make complex inferences because of the language barrier that they carry. So when you begin unpacking a TEAK, you must find and label the verbs first. In this specific case, because it is an embedded TEAK, not a TEAK that is solely by itself, um, you must find the make verb, which means that the students will be able to create something and um, actually apply it, which essentially is something that is embedded throughout our curriculum, um, our daily curriculum. So they will make complex inferences about text, meaning that they will create an inference that comes from them, um, and then they will use that inference. Ms. Arredondo, Ms. Castillo, Mr. Watts to the front. And then they will use that textual if, um, evidence to actually support their understanding. If they're unable to create and use um, their own creation, and they are unable to support what they understood because the comprehension is not there. So after you identify your verbs, you actually uh, 
go ahead and highlight or you emphasize the following words of it. So uh, for this example, figure 19, they make would be your verb and they make complex inferences. Um, and then use would be your second verb out of the second half of the teak and they use textual evidence. So after that, um, what's in green is what you're going to be making or using. So you make complex inferences about text, meaning that the text that is at hand will be um, used to create something else using your background knowledge. And um, you will use textual evidence to support your understanding. So your understanding would be um, shown that you actually comprehend the team as a whole once you're able to identify things that appear on the text. Sure. So teak vocabulary. Um, Without the user, without the understanding of these four words, it is um, it is imperative as a student for you to understand what these four words mean, because if not, you won't be able to understand them. So the four words I believe were um, necessary is complex inference, textual evidence, and support, which I'm now going to ask, which I'm now going to ask whether um, you understand these academic vocabulary. So what does complex mean to you? Something that isn't quite understood. Something that isn't quite understood. Um, and what about inferences? Inferences kind of be like an adjective. Not an adjective in just, but something in regards to that. Yes, something that you explain. Yeah, well, something that you kind of like um, make an educated based off of background information and information you provided in the book. So it would be a combination of two things. And, and how would you define textual evidence? Textual evidence is something you can directly align or phrase or the paragraph that you can directly pull out of the content to be able to justify your point. Um, and support would be what in your case? Uh, support would kind of be like, I mean, it can be textual evidence in a sense, but it can also be something that's, you know, a fact that kind of isn't necessarily to support yeah. your educatedness or your inference of the, the text. Now, are there any sort of connections that you can make between these four academic vocabulary words? They all require higher level thinking. Uh, basically, evaluating whether or not it's going to help you with your educated guess or make, or make an educated guess. Uh, when you have the textual evidence that you can provide to use that might help prove your point, you always have to have a higher, like, whether or not it actually applies and how it applies. So they all require thinking and kind of... And kind of, you're, you're meant to have knowledge behind yeah. it in order to exactly. fully understand it. Now, assuming that we were able to rate these in terms of complexity to what, whatever is easiest, um, as a Gen Ed student or as an EL top, how would you rate these? And I'll give you about a minute to Ranking from one through four. Four being the most complex. Four being the most complex, correct. Mm -hmm. Montemayor, your right is here. Jose right, Montemayor, your right is here. So we can do one would be support. Okay. Two would be complex. No, just two. One would be textual evidence. Two would be support. Three is complex and four is easy. No. So you had said one would be support. Support, um, which is essentially just backing I mean, up what just you're kidding. seeing. Sorry. One is textual evidence. Okay, one textual evidence because it is a give proof type of question that you're able to point to? Correct. Okay. Two, two B. Is support. Okay. Backing three is up what you want. Yeah. Three is complex. Three is complex. And four is easy. Now, why do you think four is the inferences? Is the most difficult and the most um, I, I hard to I feel like you, it would be the most complex because you need everything else to be able to make that inference. You can't just infer something. You need to have one, two, and three associated so you're able to pick four. Right. So then if we go back to our, before we do our, T, our um, special populations and our campus comparisons, our EL students were significantly lower than our um, campus and our economically disadvantaged and even our special education students. Considering we, uh, like I had mentioned before in seventh grade, we have around maybe 15 special education students, um, a large percentage of that are com in comparison to these actually passed, meaning that they are finding ways to grasp concepts that even EL students aren't able to understand. So I'll read our teak once again. And again, our teak weight um, is heavily, which basically means that if you get figure 19D and you understand what inferences is and what inferences um, what requires in order to infer correctly, you have a higher possible percentage of passing. So again, our teak was to make complex inferences about text and use textual evidence to support your understanding. And after you did your ranking, uh, why might inferencing be difficult for EOs opposed to Gen Ed Pop? Because they only know the language. They haven't really studied it. They, I, <laughs> if they can't write or read the language, then they probably can't speak the language effectively. Right. Um, so. so 
So in, in your specific, in you your... remember that they're not teaching in their native language. So it's right. going to be harder for me to actually read the yeah. Being from process and um, make educated guesses and uh, get all the information and come up with an answer when you're having these uh, language barriers it's harder. I mean, I, I mean, a lot of times I have answers, but I mean, I'm not it's able to participate in it. I'm thinking in their language. You know? So then in your specific case, you think in Spanish and then you translate it in your head and actually yeah. produce something in English. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to our... Our vertical alignment T. So uh, figure 19D is actually embedded in all three grade levels. In sixth grade, it is six point figure 19D. In seventh grade, it is seven point figure 19D. And in eighth grade, it is eight point figure 19D. So this T is carried on throughout um, all of middle school. So if a student is unable to master this T or to have um, some sort of comprehension of these T when they're in sixth grade, chances are once they pass on to seventh grade and the curriculum becomes far more rigorous, they won't be able to comprehend it either. And when they move on to eighth grade, there'll be even less comprehension because it is far more tougher than sixth and seventh grade. Now, vertical alignment uh, is very important as well as horizontal alignment because vertical alignment carries on through grade levels. So if a student is struggling in sixth grade and does not receive the necessary uh, support that they need in order to better um, uh, get their skills a lot better, then chances are when they reach seventh and when they each reach eighth grade, we're probably going to lose them. Uh, however, when we went back to the data, six, uh, sixth grade did not have as much trouble when it came down to, to that T because uh, they were probably receiving the support that they needed. But once they reached seventh grade, they saw a curriculum that they had never seen before, making it far more difficult for them. So if seventh grade itself is struggling um, with that specific T for, T for even in passing reading at all, chances are eighth grade, um, the numbers will continue to diminish. So then um, I do want to discuss instructional activities to improve uh, TEAK 7 point figure 19D because we, um, using the data that was already given, um, determined that this was our area of need. So I'm going to go ahead and discuss the per share providing visual sentences and the inferencing chart. Now, um, for think pair share, it's simple and efficient. So it's three basic steps. Uh, students are going to independently think or write. Um, as a teacher, you are able to give them a short story that you would like them to make an inferencing about, or um, you're able to give them a gallery walk that you want them to um, actually come up with their own type of idea regarding it. Um, you would then pair them. Uh, there are several ways of pairing them. Personally, I leave my um, selective pairing and them pairing to my higher um, POPs. And my special ed POPs, I would do the intentional pairing with. So once you pair them, it could be in a partner or a small group. Um, from personal experiences, small group would be more so for those who are able to behave and have less behavioral issues um, instead of those that are usually far more rowdy. Now, once they share, um, not only will they share amongst themselves, but they will listen to each other and be, to be able to share as a whole class. Um, so a teacher is randomly calling on students or students are volunteering answers. So um, in the think, pair, think and pair, all students will be thinking, and in the pair, um, shy kids actually get the chance to be able to practice with somebody else, um, especially because we um, we determined that our ELs were the ones that needed the most help. Our ELs usually become a lot more shy um, because they think that, that their partner is going to make fun of the way that they say things um, or maybe the way that they conjugate their verbs isn't necessarily correct. Um, so if you pair them intentionally and you assign partner A to be that student with a higher English um, level in terms of understanding and, and speaking, um, that B kid would be able to grasp onto some of the context that were said and maybe um, pronunciations, assuming that there's minimal of them. So then once they share, you'd hold kids accountable by saying, okay, partner A, what did you think partner B said? Um, so this would be helpful not only for our ELs, but for our gen pops as well, because just because somebody is marked an EL or somebody, um, or the lack thereof, the label EL, does not necessarily mean that there isn't a language barrier. Maybe they just haven't been identified. So then once they share and they tell the teacher um, out loud whether they're understanding it or not, then that's where the teacher themselves is able to um, place them in terms of level of knowledge. Now, we're going to think pair share in terms of providing visuals, which is something that assists general education students and ELs. Um, providing visuals, in my personal experience, I like to give because a lot of the students um, don't, don't respond well to simply just words on a page. 
Um, they like to see something further than that. They like to see a picture accompanied by it, or maybe they understand a picture uh, more. So in this specific picture, it's clear what's going to happen. So what do you think is going to happen here? It's going to slip on the banana peel. Now that is something that is very um, cliche, but it is something that you're able to inference, which is figure, figure uh, 19, basically. Now, inferencing, practicing, um, using the visuals. So I'm going to give you about a minute for you to read, inference, and then I will ask you your question. So it says, when Jesse's owner, Emily, was younger, what were some of her favorite things? How do you know this? So I'm going to ask you to get in pairs of three and go ahead and discuss. We could do A, B, and C. So partner A, go ahead and discuss with B and C what's your answer. Partner B is your time to discuss. Partner C is your chance to discuss. Can you confirm that she means music? So then in terms of sharing, it says when Jesse's owner, Emily, was younger, what were some of her favorite things and how do you know this? What did you discuss? So we discussed some of well, her favorite animal, animal we can infer was a horse uh, because on the shelf there's just a whole bunch of horses and it's like, I didn't find it particularly especially interesting. And you said that uh, she might have liked music because there's a good spot on the shelf as well. Um, and that's something that I do a lot of now I'm realizing. Um, so to kind of some of the inferences that we had just based off of the cups that were present. So these inferences were made solely based off of the picture, correct? Correct. Now, um, we'll go ahead and do one more. So um, later, Emily started to like new things. Why do you think she changed, and what do you think happened to her and um, to her old toys? Partner, you begin discussing. that was in there, um, and all the lip gloss, that she might have idolized animals, which is a good conclusion, I think, from the things that we just heard. Partner B, you may begin discussing. Partner C. So you can buy options by pairing the picture with this one, and of course you can count on your Years. Right. So if she focused on really detail on the significant combination of sharing, becoming more mature and, and uh, getting done. So as a whole, what do you think happened to her old toys? She probably either like donated them or gave them away or another child who might have liked horses just said that they could spend some more typically on them. Now, um, send and stem. Send and stem is another way of tailoring um, this specific this specific strategy um, we just adopted this year. It's called question scavenger hunt. So basically what you do is with your color, um, you would box in a specific question, a specific color, depending on what is being asked. So we had word, meaning, plot, text, features, main idea. Um, and the notion behind this strategy is basically that you're unable to understand what is being asked or um, unable to give an answer if you don't know what is being asked. So by doing so, uh, we have our summary, our view proof, point of view being author's purpose, figurative language. Now inference is one of in itself because it is being asked so uh, so much. So if you if we go back into our graphs, we notice that figure 19b was asked 18 times out of the 40 time out of the 40 questions um, from last year's star. Um, so if students were able to understand inferencing, then they had a bigger chance of passing. Um, so some of the sentence stems that actually accompany this would be 
the reader can infer. So the word infer actually gives off the fact that it is an inferencing question. Once students know that it is an inference, inferencing question, they now know that they must use their background knowledge of what is on text in order to create that inference. Um, the same thing as based on what was discussed in paragraph two, the author can conclude. Conclude is a synonym to infer. So the students also know that they must use their background knowledge um, in order to come up with the inference also with in addition, in, in addition to what is on the text. Now for three, it says a picture on page four leads the reader to believe. So like we just inference using the pictures um, and the visuals provided on the slides before, we know that students are able to inference. So another way would be to use the inferencing chart. So up at the top it says, what inference did you make? Um, and you could use this with any sort of small story, um, long story. The whole point of it is in order for the students to be able to inference. So you list something that is a background knowledge, something that you already know um, in regards to the story. So if the story is talking about um, laptops. So your background knowledge would be um, laptops, batteries, um, laptop needs battery often. So um, when it lacks battery, you have to plug it in. Now text clues. Now something that you can add on to that. You could say something like, um, well, if the laptop's not working, and we know that laptops, that we know that laptops need to be charged in order for them to turn on, we can make an inference that in order for us to turn on the laptop, we must plug the charger in. So that was a very elementary basic um, inference. However, higher level students are able to think more critically and are able to use their background knowledge in ways uh, with a combination with their clues to create an inference that you really probably overlook. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.